Welcome today to the Mirowitz Center program with Dale and Stephen. Would you like to continue with the introduction? I, I'm not sure that this is as much an introduction as a welcome. Most of you have joined us in, on previous occasions, so you know that you're in for a treat as usual when you join Dale's talks on any aspect of art. This series on women in art has been particularly fascinating and I'm sure you join me in looking forward to her presentation today. Dale, as always, thank you so much for your presentations and for all the work that you do to make these presentations so memorable. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you to, um, to Mirowitz for having me. Um, to all the rest of you, welcome back. I hope you're all well and that you had a good Thanksgiving and a, um, and a really fun Hanukkah this year. You know, it's, it's, it's such a pleasure to see you all again. I wish I could just spread out my screen so I could see, the, see all of you, but the ones that I can see, I'm glad to, that you're here. Um, today, we're gonna be looking at um, some works of art from some incredible women artists that are all um, featured in SLAM's permanent collection. So some of them you're going to be familiar with and some of them are gonna be new to you, but I promise you they are all just amazing. So hold on your hats. Okay, if you were to believe what many of us were taught about Western art, we would reduce centuries of artistic output to a bunch of white male masterpieces where women are rarely mentioned and never accorded the status anywhere near the big boys. And we would think women had little to do with art until the 20th century. So let's try this. Okay, everybody close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes and visualize an artist. Okay, you probably picture a man, maybe holding a palette, wearing a beret, probably most likely poor and a bit offbeat. But I would venture to say that very few of you would have visualized a woman. According to the National Museum of Women in the Arts, 51% of visual artists today are women. And that makes sense because that's the percentage of women in the population. But when it comes to exhibitions and gallery representation, the numbers tell a much less optimistic story. In many museums, for example, only five to 15% of artists are represented in the museum. That's incredible, five to 15%. The market for work by women doubled over the past decade, and that's really good, except it's less than the total sales for Picasso alone. Here's some more disturbing kind of facts. Um, just 11% of all acquisitions at 26 prominent U.S. museums were by women, 11%. 14% of the exhibitions in the past decade were by women, 14%. 96% of the arts sold at auction are by male artists. Now, this one just blew me away. 27 women out of 318 artists are represented in Janssen's art history survey. Now that's up from zero in the 1980s, but still just 27 is not very good. And the most expensive work of art sold by a woman artist at auction was by Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, it sold in 2014 for $44 million, but that's just a quarter of the record-breaking $179 million paid for Picasso's Les Femmes d'Algier the following year. So the question has been asked, why haven't there been more women artists, more great women artists throughout Western history? But maybe we should rephrase the question. 
why haven't more women been considered great artists throughout Western history? It's a fact that historically speaking, women didn't enjoy the same rights as men. Male artists were mostly free to experiment and express their creativity to their heart's desire, while female artists were often not taken seriously or afforded the same opportunities and exposures in spite of their talent. This cartoon emphasizes just that fact. All of the great masters were men. But it's still the case that the art that we consider to be the most valuable in monetary and cultural terms is almost all by men. It's the reason that museums in the world considered to have the greatest and strongest collections are the ones that boast works by Matisse and Reynolds, Van Gogh and Picasso, Pollock and Rothko. That a female equivalent for each of these artists doesn't just kind of roll off the tongue, says it all. But in truth, there have always been great women artists. Since the beginning of time, women have been an invaluable asset with intellectual gifts, creative talents, and an indomitable spirit. Plenty of women in all cultures, in all ages, made functional objects for the home like quilts and pottery and clothing. Women have been carving, carving their own unique niche in art for centuries, but we really don't know who made them for the most part. There is an old saying in the art world, anonymous was a woman. In recent years, scholars have worked to restore this lost chapter of our cultural heritage. So for the next three sessions, we're going to be looking at some of the best known women artists, try to understand how their achievements fit into the time and place in which they worked and examine some of the ethical, social and political issues that arise as a result of this strange situation where significant talent has been suppressed. Slowly but surely women made their mark in the art world. From ancient Greece and Rome, there are accounts of women painters who earned more than their male counterpart. And in the Middle Ages, nuns made tapestries and illuminated manuscripts. In the Renaissance, daughters were trained to help in their father's studios, and some even went on to careers themselves. By the Victorian era, women were sought after as portraitists, and by the 20th century, the number of women artists swelled but only a few women artists through history could boast the reputation of male artists in their day. Even in the face of challenges and barriers, the world was gifted with remarkable female artists throughout history, like the ones you see here. These women in art belong to different social eras and various art movements and have vastly different working conditions and points of views. Each of them had to overcome their own set of adversities to succeed whether these obstacles were imposed by the society they lived in or by the artist's own life path. They were tough cookies. This quote describes these women per perfectly. And I absolutely love this quote. It's kind of a great life lesson. The same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg. The same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg. It's about what you're made of, not the circumstance. And all of these women certainly overcame their circumstance. Don't you love that quote? I love that quote. Even though we cannot possibly hope to mention every single female artist who left remarkable marks in the history of art, we will highlight some that inspired the world with their extraordinary craft and their unyielding courage. So let's take a look at what life was like with some of the females in the West who manage against all odds to make art. Some of the overlooked and underrepresented female artists highlighted in SLAM and begin in the Middle Ages. Women in the Middle Ages were not all damsels in distress, waiting for their knights in shining armor. In classical civilizations in Greece and Rome, women were virtual prisoners of the men in their lives. But medieval women took part in almost every aspect of public life, 
even though they were married at age 15. They became writers and artists and merchants and nuns, and they ran the kingdoms while their husbands were away fighting in the Crusades. They operated businesses, formed, made textiles and illustrated manuscripts, wrote books and composed and performed music. We think of art in the Middle Ages and we think of the great cathedrals, but, but many other arts flourished during that time. Illuminated manuscripts and textiles to name two. And many of these artists were women, either working in businesses owned by male family members are living as nuns in convents. Records even tell us that there were women sculptors and architects too. From the beginning of time, the production of textiles has been pretty much the domain of women. Women of all classes participated in designing, weaving and stitching cloth. Okay, someone said, tongue in cheek, that if men had done the weaving, underwear would be hanging in the Louvre. This silk panel on the left displays the talent of women weavers in a complicated design. From the eighth century onward, Spanish weavers produce world famous silks, continuing a tradition brought to Spain by Muslim conquerors. The illuminated manuscript on the right may or may not have been created by a woman but the richly colored page once, once formed a part of a choral book and is a fine example of the type of beautiful illustrations of medieval books. The painting is characteristics of the workshop of the master of the Conradin Bible, named after the Bible that was owned by the German boy emperor Conrad V. Now, we don't see illuminated manu manuscripts very often at Slam because they are so fragile. So this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about them. Before the invention of mechanical printing, books were handmade objects, treasured as works of art and symbols of enduring knowledge. Illuminated manuscripts are handwritten books with painted decoration that generally includes precious metals such as gold or silver. Medieval books were expensive items and some manuscripts were made even more precious by illumination. The word illuminated comes from the Latin meaning to light up. For a book to be truly illuminated, it had to be decorated with gold. Indeed, in the Middle Ages, the book becomes an attribute of God. Every stage in the creation of a medieval book required intensive labor, sometimes involving the collaboration of entire workshops. Parchment for the pages had to be made from the dried hide of animals, cut to size and sewn. Inks had to be mixed, pens prepared, and the pages ruled for lettering. A scribe copied the text from an established edition. An artist might then embellish it with small painted scenes, intricate borders, ornate chapter letters, and even elaborate full page paintings. The medieval women who were illuminators were placed in a position of trust as this type of art was complex and costly to produce. The text of the document would be completed first and the women artists would then paint the illuminations. The medieval women who were illustrators would design the illumination using wax tablets as a sketch pad and the design would then be traced onto the vellum. Such decorations illustrated the text and helped guide people through it. The pictures were especially important because during medieval times, many people, even those who owned the manuscripts, couldn't read. The beautiful illuminations also serve as bookmarks of a kind, helping the reader to find the beginning of each new section. So because many scribes and illuminators and bookmakers in the Middle Ages were nuns, their work remained largely anonymous. It would have been un, unseemly and against their religious vows to claim ownership of any of the illuminations they had painted. So these medieval nuns became some of the most important women artists of the Middle Ages. Everyone believes that art in the Renaissance was all a guy's game. Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo, History fights over who was the greatest male artist of the era. 
as though it was an aesthetic Olympics contest. But in the Renaissance, women legally belonged to their husband and were controlled by their parents until married. And that's kind of weird because England was ruled for half a century by queens, yet women had almost no legal power. Marriage cost women all personal rights. They had 13 or 14 kids and only maybe half of the babies survived. Women couldn't work for themselves, couldn't live alone. And upper-class women had two options, marriage or cloister. During the Renaissance in Italy, artists went through apprenticeships with another established artist, then they joined a union, and then they set up a workshop of their own. The whole system was closed to women. They were barred from unions, guilds, and academies, but many studios were filled with wives, sisters, and daughters of some great master. One example is the workshop of Jacopo Tintoretto. His daughter, Marietta Robusti, was, an educa was educated and worked in her father's studio with her brothers. Her ability and talent were well known in Italy. Robusti lived in Venice all of her life. Her artistic training consisted in serving an apprenticeship in her father's workshop. The conventions of the time dictated that women couldn't learn art, but they could learn art, but their works were not welcome in the public world of art sale. Robusti, as did most of her female counterparts, gained access to the art world through the male artists of their family. Often their fathers or brothers, often their fathers or brothers, maybe uncles, but basically fathers or brothers. However, it is said that Robusti's achievements were buried under the name of her father. After her death, the decline in the work by Tintoretto was, was ascribed to the grief for his daughter, rather than the loss of the person who was probably his best and most skillful assistant. Many works that are attributed to the male family members in her family might certainly have been made by Robusti herself. Maybe this one here. As talented as she was, she received no recognition or commissions of, for any major work. She was looked at as daddy's little helper. The women that follow should be celebrated for their fearlessness, perseverance, and their commitment to the craft. I think that each of them would agree with this quote. The question isn't, who's going to let me? The question is, who's going to stop me? Today, Italian Baroque painter Artemisia Gentileschi it's known as one of the most skillful painters of her era. But the artist had a difficult time forging a career as an artist. In 17th century Europe, at a time when women artists were not easily accepted, Artemisia was exceptional. She challenged conventions and defied expectations with her gorgeous paintings. In Italy, life for women artists continued in the same vein, with women working in their fathers and husbands' studios excluded from apprenticeship in the studio of other successful artists. Genileschi was the daughter of a painter, Orazio Genileschi. Her father trained her as an artist and introduced her to the world of working artists in Rome. Other than artistic training, she had little or no schooling. She didn't learn to read or write until she was an adult. However, by the time she was 19, she produced one of, one of the works for which she is best known this painting of Danai. The mythological story unfolds as Danai's father was told by an oracle that his daughter's offspring would destroy him. So he locked her in her, in her chamber, impenetrable by potential suitors. I mean, what else would you do? Undeterred, the god Zeus fell instantly in love with her, transformed himself into a shower of golden coins and impregnated Danai. She eventually gave birth to Perseus, who went on to have many heroic adventures, such as killing Medusa. One day, Perseus was in a competition, threw a javelin, which hit an old man by mistake, his grandfather. The oracle was right. 
His very early work shows Artemisia's accomplished handling of the female nude, as well as her brilliant depiction of textures and textiles. You can feel the velvet in the linens just by looking at it. And incredibly, it's painted on copper. What a talent. We only know of about 34 of her paintings that have survived, but many more that are attributed to her father might have actually been painted by her. Now, Artemisia's life story is a tragic one in many ways. She put her life into her art. And what a brutally damaged life it was. Being the daughter of an artist was the only way a young woman could hope to learn the complex skills that it took to paint professionally in the Baroque age. It seemed that her father, Orazio, had ambition for his daughter. As her skill developed, he hired an upcoming artist, Agostino Tazzi, to give her lessons. Then, in 1612, Tazzi was accused of raping Artemisia. The resulting trial lasted seven months and shocked Rome. Amazingly, every word of this court case survived. Jodolewski speaks to us from this 400-year-old document with a voice that is eloquent, courageous, and compelling. It's a rare example of a woman in the pre-modern era taking a stance against the oppression that was part of her day-to-day -day life. In the trial, Artemisia is portrayed as a teenager who spent all her time painting, rarely going out. Her rapist, meanwhile, emerges an even worse character than he first seemed. Several witnesses claimed he even murdered his wife and he could offer no good defense. Janileski was tortured in that Roman courtroom in 1612. Ropes were wrapped around her fingers and pulled tight to see if she was telling the truth. Across the court sat the man who raped her and no one thought of torturing him. Defiantly, Janileski told him that her thumb screws were the wedding ring he promised. Yet Janileski was tortured and Tatsi was sentenced to a year in prison but set free. Why? Even though everyone knew he was a villain, he was protected by the Pope because his art, which is forgotten today, was prized at the time. With painted images, Artemisia fought back against the male violence that dominated her world in, in by the 1620s. She was a successful artist working as far from Rome as she could get. She couldn't write her story because as she revealed during the trial, she was more or less illiterate. She could paint it though. Nevertheless, her late career was extraordinary. She swiftly became recognized as one of the most accomplished artists of her day and, and accommodated patronage that included the Medici family and King Charles I of England. She spent most of her life in Na the rest of her life in Naples. Artemisia turned the horrors of her own life, repression, injustice, rape, into biblical and mythological paintings that tend to deal with female victims. Instead of a sword, Artemisia was armed with a brush. The odds facing women artists in the 18th century were nearly insurmountable. The vast majority of women who were able to make a living in the arts learned their trade from their fathers, as did a young Elizabeth Viget. At 15, she was painting the aristocracy. In her 20s, she was the favorite painter of Marie Antoinette. And by her 30s, she was fleeing the French Revolution. Born in Paris in 1755, Vigée Le Brun's journey to fame and success was rapid. Having received some training from her portrait's father, who died when she was 12, she was encouraged to continue her artistic studies, although being a woman, she didn't have access to formal training. This portrait, the artist brother Etienne, alludes to his interest in letters. He later became a celebrated writer. It includes a sheaf of paper and, and some pens and a pen. At the age of 15, Vigée Lebrun was earning enough money from her portrait painting to support herself, her widowed mother, and her younger brother. She created this portrait when she was only 18 years old. I, I, I can't imagine. They parted ways later in life um, and her brother died an alcoholic. This is just a charming portrait. 
like most of her work, soft and sweet. The pleasing naturalism and relaxed manner of B.J. Lebrun's portraits, like this of her brother, became immensely popular among the elite and a trademark of the artist's distinctive style. Her ability to depict her subject in a flattering, elegant style made her one of the most popular portrait artists in France. Now her fame skyrocketed when she was patronized by Marie Antoinette, for whom she painted some 30 portraits. It was royal intervention that led to her admittance to the Royal Academy at the age of 28, only one of four female members. Her marriage to the art dealer Jean-Baptiste Lebrun in 1776 proved less successful, largely due to her husband's gambling. 1789, she left her husband and her country. Fearing the progress of the revolution and a slanderous press campaign against her due to her association with the queen, she fled to Italy with her young daughter, Julie. Despite living in exile, working and traveling across Europe and raising her daughter single-handedly, Lebrun was able to maintain a successful career. Her portraits continued to be commissioned by European nobility and royalty, mainly because of their emotional tenure, which you can see in this painting by her brother. She painted 660 portraits during her career. Her high fees enabled her to retire in comfort back in France. She died at the age of 86, having left behind impressive portraits that documented some of the most famous faces in history and a legacy of breaking taboos imposed on both artists and women. The unknown woman in this painting is dressed in Turkish clothing, a popular trend in London throughout the 18th century. It represented the exotic. It represented faraway places, a person interested in the unconventional or the unfamiliar, a symbol of a person who is adventurous, spirited, and not afraid to try something out of the ordinary, just like the artist herself. Angelica Kaufman was also trained by her father, a minor itinerant muralist and portrait painter. She was a child prodigy, and by the age of 12, was receiving commissions from European notables. But her fame skyrocketed when she came to London. She spent only 15 years in England, but made a significant impact on 18th century London art scene becoming one of only two female founding members of the Royal Academy. She wasted no time establishing her place in the mid 18th century art world. She married a man who pretending to be a Swedish count had tricked her into marrying him so that he could stay in England. The terrible marriage was quickly annulled. During her lifetime, she was one of the highest paid and most sought after portrait artists, second only to her great friend and champion, Sir Joshua Reynolds. There was a scandal regarding her affair with Reynolds, but, but she claimed they were only friends. Kaufman's wealth during her 15 year career based in England came to around 14,000 pounds, which was an enormous sum at the time. Angelica Kaufman may have used this painting as an ad to convince her customers to have their portraits painted in this popular Turkish dress. She was a businesswoman at heart. She had an unparalleled knack for self-promotion. She cashed in on her popularity and oversaw the marketing of a distinct Kaufman brand of merchandise. She probably would have had Angelica bobbleheads and coffee mugs if they had existed back then. In fact, she succeeded in creating an entirely new industry from her artwork based on the 18th century techniques of mechanical reproduction. These new printing techniques enabled the good taste of the money delete to be brought to the masses. Hers was a unique combination of artistic talent and business acumen. Copies of Kaufman's paintings were often found hanging in the most fashionable places in London. A contemporary at the time described the sheer number of prints of her work in circulation around the world as proof that everyone had gone Angelica mad. Indeed, it was as though the painter had celebrity status in the 18th century 
comparable to that of the Beatles. She was an international sensation. Angelica Kaufman took everywhere that she went by storm. Her skill was unquestionable. Louise Drolling was a French painter and draftswoman. Both her father and her older brother were celebrated artists in their day. Drolling was not a prolific artist. And as she admitted herself in a letter in 1828, the inventory after her death mentions only a dozen of her works. Having been taught by her father, she practiced a highly skillful, but very traditional art. Thus, some of her paintings and drawings have been attributed to either her father or her brother. This painting may be an intimate self-portrait of the artist at work in her studio. The painting was awarded a gold medal at the 1824 Salon and was acquired for the prestigious collecting of a French aristocrat. Her treatment of cloth and interest in capturing um, a moment in time are all indicative neo of neoclassical influences. The textures and details capture this moment in a peaceful scene. She shared a studio with her brother who was also a painter. The open portfolio suggests a studio, but orderly arrangement of things suggests kind of an imaginary room with all of her favorite things. Drolling's a, a limited number of paintings may suggest that if there was one good painting by such a woman, there may be more as yet undiscovered treasures. Album or friendship quilts were among the most beautiful and sophisticated American quilts produced in the 19th century. These quilts made in Baltimore in the mid 1800s were stitched by groups of women. This quilt was made by a, a tribute, it was made as a tribute by a group of Methodist church women. Two inscriptions begin with the words friendship's offering and the friendship's gift. An additional message offers an insight into the political events of the time. From one rough and ready to the worthy president, Marianne Huggins in 1848. Uh, U.S. Army General Zachary Taylor, who became the nation's president in 1849, was known as the old rough and ready. So it was kind of a, a compliment. Quilt with Wig's defeat on the right displays exceptional skill. It's also remarkable for its political origins. Before women could vote or express political opinions publicly, they made their ideas known through less direct means, such as quilting. This quilt pattern was, direct, was created in celebration of the narrow defeat of the Whig candidate, Henry Clay, to the Democrat, James Polk, in the 1844 election. The appliqued plumes represent the tail feathers of a rooster, which was at that time a symbol of the Demo Democrat party. I don't know, would you rather have a, a, a rooster or a donkey? I'm, I'm not sure. But the pattern is suitable for quilting with fabric scraps and, and could thus be created in a less fluent home um, and, and be identified with the Democratic Party. Harriet Hosmer challenged the 19th century idea that sculpture was a profession only for men. Encouraged by her father to pursue physical exercise after her mother and siblings died of tuberculosis, Hosmer had an active childhood. She was sent to a progressive school that fostered independence and provided her with creative female role models. She became determined to sculpt. Her father, a prominent physician, built her a studio so she could pursue her hobby of sculpting animals out of clay. She wanted to study human anatomy. A, necess a necessity for sculpture, sculptors and a subject forbidden to women. Being barred from studying anatomy on the East Coast because she was a woman, her supportive father sent her to St. Louis to study anatomy at the Missouri Medical College, a predecessor to WashU School of Medicine. She then sailed for Rome in 1852 to pursue a career where she worked with a group of other women artists and attracted a patronage of affluent tourists. Hosmer was not the only female sculptor in Rome at the time. 
She was one of a group of American women sculptors who had gathered in Italy to seek artistic companionship, liberal working conditions, abundant examples of classical statuary, and access to skilled artisans and sources of marble. Of that group, however, she was probably the only one who earned enough money from her art to support herself. She worked alone in her large studio, lived by herself, and went horseback riding without a male escort. Most of her subjects were tragic women from myth and literature, such as Zenobia. Zenobia, one of her masterpieces, was a third century queen of the land that is now Syria. One of antiquity's two famous female heads of state, far more politically ferocious than Cleopatra. In 267 AD, after her husband's death, Zenobia ruled Palmyra for about six years as regent for her minor son and was a shrewd diplomat and military strategist. She oversaw a cultured and intellectual court and a tolerant multi-ethnic empire. She challenged the authority of the Roman Empire and led her troops, an unusual kind of role for women, women in antiquity, and she led her troops to victories in Egypt in Asia Minor. Her actions changed the empire's eastern frontier, and she was celebrated for courage and daring as she expanded Palmyra's territory. But the Roman forces eventually overpowered her armies and she was captured. Zenobia's army was utterly destroyed and Zenobia was marched in chains as you see on the sculpture. So she was marched um, in chains um, as part of the emperor's triumphal procession through Rome. Emperor Aurelian was so impressed with Zenobia's dignity and beauty while shackled that he freed her and gave her a villa. Although defeated, Zenobia's regal bearing led to her pardon. At the height of her reign, Zenobia was one of the most powerful women the world had ever seen. She took on Rome, the Roman Empire and she captivated an emperor. The dignified statue of Zenobia is, I think is, is Hosmer's own commentary on female power. Some have said that Zenobia is one of the most famous objects produced during the golden age of American classical sculpture. The dignity of the figure's profile, her head held high and the intricate details of her ancient dress testified to Hosmer's sophisticated carving abilities and strong feminist beliefs. She saw in Zenobia an embodiment of the woman's ability to move beyond the constraints placed on her. Zenobia's bearing stresses her strength rather than her victimization. Zenobia in change is an homage to another woman who has taken charge of her own destiny. Born of a black father and Native American mother, Ed Edmonia Lewis became the first non-white American sculptor to achieve national prominence. Her, her parentage set her apart and added to her exotic image. After both parents died when she was young, Lewis was reared by a maternal aunt in upstate New York. She had a half brother who traveled west during the gold rush and earned enough money to finance her education, a rare opportunity for a woman, especially a woman or a minority in the 19th century. She was welcomed at the Progressive Oberlin College in 1859, but her time there was not easy. After being cleared of poisoning charges, Lewis was unable to finish her last term at Oberlin following allegations that she had stolen paint brushes in a picture frame. Despite dismissal of the theft charges, the college asked her to leave with no chance to complete her education and receive her degree. But again, with her brother's financial backing, Edmonia Lewis opened her own studio in Boston. She gained fame, making sculptures and medallions portraits of famous Bostonians and famous abolitionists. With some money and notoriety, Lewis also moved to Rome in 1865 the center where Harriet Hosmer was. 
um, the, she began to work in marble and adopted the neoclassical style. Lewis, who often lacked the money to hire help, chiseled most of her own figures. She continued to find inspiration in the lives of abolitionists and Civil War heroes who were the subject of much of her work. The sculpture was made during that time and is of an unknown woman. Soft facial features, a delicately carved lace bodice, and wavy hair adorned with a flower communicate not only the taste and beauty of the unknown sitter, but also Edmonia Lewis's skill as a sculptor. Now, new research has suggested that the sitter might be the daughter of one of the wealthiest free black families in St. Louis. Edmonia said, some praise me because I am a colored girl and I don't wanna be that, and I don't want that kind of praise. I had rather you would point out my defects for that will teach me something. She dressed like a man, she painted like a man, and she was one of the most successful women of her time. Rosa Bonor was a woman who defied traditional gender norms. She went to great lengths to break out of the stereotypical female role, even so far as to get the police to give her permission to wear trousers and men's clothing instead of skirts and dresses. Thank you, Rosa. Though Bonor got her permit, her predicament highlights the challenges that faced most women who aspired to be artists before the 20th century. Frequently, women artists had no access to art schools, faced difficulties traveling alone to find subjects in the countryside, and were forbidden from sketching male models. But despite the obstacles, Bonor turned her great talent and love of animals into a specialty that made her possibly the 19th century's most famous female artist. With the fortune she earned from her work, Bonheur bought a chateau and set up a zoo next to it filled with animals that she painted. Bonheur lived unconventionally. She wore her hair short, she smoked, and she lived with a female companion. Even though she mostly enjoyed activities reserved for men, such as hunting, Bonheur still preferred the company of women. She had spent years living with female partners. She said, as far as males go, I only like the bulls I paint. Born in Bordeaux in 1822, Bonheur received her training from her father, a painter, who encouraged his young daughter's artistic talents and independence. Precocious and gifted, she was successful from a very young age. She exhibited at the Salon for the first time at the age of 19 and received medals for her work. Bonor's love of animals, especially horses, provided inspiration for her work. Working from direct observation of nature, she kept a small menagerie, frequented slaughterhouses, and dissected animals to gain anatomical knowledge. Bonor was a pivotal figure in realism, with animals being her subject of choice. This work represents a relay hunt whereby riders would use fresh groups of horses to relieve their exhausted animals. Bonor has precisely rendered the anatomy of the horses farms as well as the sheen of their coats in brown, white, and gray. She painted animals in every state from vigorous action to complete repose. With her tendency to paint outside of the studio, Bonor unwittingly aided the birth of a new art movement Impressionism. Led by her example, artists slowly replaced painting in their studios with painting outside in nature on plein air, shifting the focus to a more spontaneous style of painting. American painter Mary Cassatt was outspoken in her feminist principles. Her journey brought her from the United States to France from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts to private French tutors. She spent most of her adult life in France and exhibited with the Impressionists. From childhood, Mary Cassatt was determined to become a painter. Her father, Robert, a banker, said he would rather see her dead. Cassatt was the only American to fully integrate in the most important artistic movement of the 19th century, Impressionism. She was successful in her lifetime. 
She sold enough to buy herself a chateau and fine clothes. Cassatt declared herself unfit for marriage or motherhood. And in spite of this, her subject was often the relationship between mothers and children. Cassatt is not known to have had any romantic attachments. She never had children, yet she was unparalleled at capturing the natural tenderness of mothers with infants. Like other Impressionists, Cassatt painted her own family and friends in everyday settings and depicted them with great precision. Edgar Degas, Cassatt's frequent collaborator and a known misogynist, said of her painting, I do not admit that a woman can paint like that. Cassatt strongly believed the painting needed to reflect modern life. In this print, two women shared tea in a conversation in a room depicted in soft colors. Skillful hand inking technique create the variety of hues and the hand application of gold paint highlights the rims of the cup and saucers. In addition to her success as a painter, Cassatt was also recognized as a printmaker and her greatest achievement in printmaking includes this image. When her deteriorating eyesight prevented her from creating art anymore, Cassatt remained an ardent supporter of women's rights in women's suffrage movement. She granted her female painting subjects a sense of value and respect that male impressionists often lacked in their work. And she wholeheartedly believed that women should be awarded the same opportunities and treatment as men. Cassatt was an invaluable advisor, helping introduce European art to major collectors in the United States. If Cassatt were alive today, she would be called an influencer. Her fondest dream was for the United States to build art collections comparable to those in Europe. To that end, she guided the purchase of rich American collectors on condition that they promised to leave their treasures to museums. Cassatt had three strikes against her, her gender, her foreigners, and her reputation as the painter of motherhood. Feminists have regarded Cassatt with ambivalence. On the one hand, she's a rare example from the past of a woman who succeeded in a male dominated field. On the other hand, her portrayal of women in society could be interpreted as frivolous, while motherhood, the theme with which she's most associated, was long regarded by feminists as tantamount to enslavement. She said the male world was totally covered by male artists and that female artists needed to embrace the eternal grand theme of mother and child. Bessie Panervado gained recognition for intimate bronzes of mothers and children as well. Born in St. Louis, Vano grew up in Chicago where her family moved in 1874. She was invalided as a little girl and never grew beyond four feet, eight inches tall. In her teens, she studied at the Art Institute, paying for her tuition by making portrait statues of society women. They were called potterines. A young mother has defined her artistic ability identity to this day. With the instant success of this piece, her name has become synonymous with sculptural representation of motherhood in which psychological mood takes precedence over physical description. This work became one of Van Ow's most sought after sculptures and was reproduced many times. Although there is a convincing sense of the female body in the sculpture, the abundant fabric serves to soften the form emotionally. The mother's facial features are simplified, but her tender gaze upon her child conveys the intimacy of their relationship. Her career continued to prosper. She earned many medals, had important one woman exhibition and received large public commissions such as the Burnett Fountain in New York Central Park and a portrait of James Sherman in the US Capitol. She said, I have only my bronze and marble babies, but I love them as much as if they were my flesh and blood. My offspring never grow up and I have no heart heartaches and disappointments over them. The early decade of the 20th century saw the emergence of a new image of woman in a society who kicked off centuries of social restrictions. 
they smoked, they danced in public, they held jobs, and they generally did most, most things 19th century women were barred from doing. The number of women who worked outside the home in the 1920s rose almost 50% throughout the decade. While women still constitute a small number in the professional population, they were slowly increasing their participation in law, social work, engineering, and medicine. It was a revolutionary change. As the 1900s began, women were, were poised to take their place as artists in numbers never seen before. Art education had opened up by the end of the last century. And for those who were able to afford it, the prospect of training seriously became a reality. These are just four of those trailblazing artists and we'll end today with those. Kata Kolvitz was a fantastic observer. Her works are at times hard while possessing an incredible tenderness. She worked on themes such as poverty, hunger, motherhood, death, or bereavement. In 1919, she became the first woman in the modern era to be elected to the Prussian Academy of Arts, later becoming the first woman professor there. With her political art often disseminated in newspapers and posters, she sought to reach a broad audience. And in this, she, she really did succeed. So much so in fact, that in 1933, the Nazis forced her to resign from the Academy and effectively prevented her from exhibiting her work. In Bread, she captured the desperation in a malnourished child's sunken eyes as she pleased with her mother for help. Another child begging for food pulls the woman's dress. More than 900,000 German civilians died of starvation during World War I due to the British naval blockade. Food shortages continued during the currency crisis that followed the war's end. Colvitz made prints like this one to bring attention to the issue of hunger. A committed pacifist, she wrote, every war is answered by a new war until everything is smashed. In Sleeping Woman with a Child, with incredible kind of economy of lines, Kata Colvitz depicted an intimate scene of a mother resting with her baby. It's a rare moment of peace among her subjects, most of which center on the war's devastating impact on women and children. The artist's youngest son was killed in World War I at age 18. And I think that this knowledge adds kind of a layer of intensity to the image as a personal memory of loss. Influenced by both French and German styles, at a time of her early death in childbirth, Modersen Becker had developed a highly individualized style. Like Kata Kolwitz, she's sometimes seen as the precursor to Impressionism. She produced work with a deep sympathy for the local peasantry. In this painting, two girls with striking green eyes stand within a wooded area. Wistful children occupy a dream world. Yet the children differ from the sentimentalized doll-like children of the 19th century. Hers is a more flattened, bold, simplified style with primitive rendering of the body shape. A deliberately straightforward style of flat color and strong outlines. The painting isn't centered, it's weighted to one side. Neither child looks directly at the viewer each looking in a different direction, seemingly to make a statement about the individuality of the children. The repeated vertical lines of the trees add to the overall pattern. Color was chosen for expressive qualities, not descriptive ones. The eyes are startling green and the faces unusually rosy. Adelaide Robineau, was one of the most influential figures in ceramics just after the turn of the century. She became interested in drawing and China painting as a young woman. At the beginning of the 20th century, she was enlisted by Edward Lewis for his dream team in his new ceramic factory in St. Louis. So she and her family joined the faculty of the People University at University City Porcelain Works where she exhibited 
and produced over 90 objects in a year and a half. She participated in the innovative collaborative porcelain making and educational enterprise at University City, and she created some of the most exquisite work in porcelain ever to be fashioned in this country. By the time of her death in 1929, Robineau was widely recognized as the preeminent artist potter in America and the first to produce porcelain objects that rivaled those from European porcelain factories in both design and execution. Robineau's works are characterized by jewel-like glazes, painstaking carved decoration, and the fine and finely detailed incising. She was known for exacting technical work, often carving into the vessel using crochet needles and dental tools. She was one of the few women to make pots from clay to finish, whereas most female ceramicists focus merely on painting the surface. So how much do you know about UCD pottery? Well, it's really an interesting story. Edward Lewis, a publisher, entrepreneur, and all around snake oil salesman, founded the UCD Pottery and People's University at the beginning of the century. His character was a bit suspicious. The university closed after Lewis bankrupted and World War I began. The idea was simple. Women sold magazine subscriptions and got correspondence courses in return. The best students qualified to come to University City to study with the resident artists such as Robineau and others worked in their homes to earn money. Lewis was the founder and first mayor of University City. UCD Hall was built by Lewis to house his publishing company and Lewis Park is a beautiful example of, uh, in Lewis Park on Del Mar is, um, is named after him. The enterprise lasted only a few years, but the work is a beautiful example of art pottery at the turn of the century. You can see a permanent display of these works on the third floor um, of the museum. If you walk up the kind of fancy staircase, um, you'll be right next to it. For seven decades, Georgia O'Keeffe was a major figure in American art a trailblazing artist best known for her paintings of magnified flowers, animal skulls, and a New Mexico landscape. The, these are three of O'Keeffe's painting, paintings in Slam's permanent collection. They each evoke the magnified shape of a flower. Georgia O'Keeffe often selected details of nature as her subjects and enlarged or distilled them until they took on a totally new appearance. She created a highly personal artistic language rooted in abstract forms found in nature. Her magnified images so fascinated O'Keefe that she says she forgot what they were while she was painting them. A third painting here, the third, the one on, on the far right, was sold to a St. Louis couple, allowing O'Keefe to buy her first Model A Ford. From the time she met the prominent photographer and New York gallery owner, Alfred Stieglitz in January of 1916 until his death of 1940, in 1946, Stieglitz vigorously promoted her work and O'Keefe never had to struggle once Stieglitz took charge. She went from Stieglitz's client to muse to mistress to wife. When Stieglitz invited O'Keefe to exhibit her work at his gallery, he was more than 20 years older than the young artist and married. Stieglitz was inspired by O'Keefe as a person as, and as an artist. A well-known photographer, Stieglitz asked O'Keefe to pose for him. She appeared in over 300 nude photos taken by Stieglitz and the images created a stir of controversy in the New York art community at the time. The relationship progressed and O'Keefe became Stieglitz's mistress and then wife. After Stieglitz died, she moved to New Mexico. There she found new subjects to paint in the sun bleached animal bones and rugged mountains that dominate the terrain. The neighbors thought she might be a witch, always dressed in black with ferocious dogs and a collection of skulls. But she really, she financed the community Little League and rec centers in her community. Her rich legacy of some 900 paintings has continued to attract subsequent generations of artists and art lovers. Even as Mrs. Alfred Stieglitz, one of the most influential modern art promoters of the 20th century, 
She was a female artist, unafraid of displaying what she was artistically capable of and who did not let herself be defined by any one label. Georgia O'Keeffe remained simply herself. Our final piece today is a sculpture by Renee Sintenis, who is a German sculptor known for her small sculptures of athletes and young animals. She was Berlin's original hipster artist, a bold and fashionable Weimar Frau who never shied away from using her image to sell her art. She's said to have been the most photographed woman in the Weimar Republic. With her men's jackets and page boy haircut, she embodied the 1920s it girl, just as we imagined her. Advertising cigarettes, partying all night, riding her horse and meeting poets and painters at cafes. Yet behind her carefree appearance, Sintenis was fiercely determined. She had a very modern lifestyle. She drove her own car, an American Studebaker, liked to attend boxing events, and used her image to sell art, which was something new at the time. There are pictures of her in her foundry, chiseling bronze out of mold with her tools, wearing red high-heeled shoes in a protective apron. By the 1920s, she was world famous. The small, her sculptures were affordable for bourgeois, bourgeois households. So she became very rich. Her work garnered critical acclaim too. In 1931, Sentinus became the first woman to, the second woman, I'm sorry, to enter Berlin's prestigious Academy of Arts after Kataklowicz, who we, we saw earlier. The Nazi takeover of power put an end to Sentinus's careful life in Berlin. With her foreign name, cropped hair, and Jewish grandparents, she was a prime target for censorship. Deemed non-Aryan, she was expelled from the Academy of Arts and had her work removed from any public museum. One self-portrait was included in the Nazi degenerate art exhibit in 1937. But Sintinus fame found an ambassador in the shape of one small animal, a little standing bear. It's really tiny. She sculpted it in 1932 and reworked versions of the bear were offered to the city of Berlin, by the city of Berlin to its guests. In 1963, two years before Sintinus' death, one was presented to a visiting John F. Kennedy and he kept it on his desk. According to ancient mythology, this sculpture represents the story of the god Apollo who had insulted Cupid, the god of love. Becoming angry, Cupid shot a golden arrow at Apollo, causing him to fall in love with the nymph Daphne, the virgin. He then shot Daphne with a leaden arrow so she could never love Apollo back. Poor Apollo, madly in love, continually chased after her as she ran away. Daphne begged help from her father who turned her into a laurel tree so she would be safe from Apollo. Apollo was grief stricken. Here you see Daphne turning into the tree. The laurel tree became sacred of Apollo and as a wreath was used by emperors for all the winners of the Olympic games. And great heroes in the years to come would be crowned with laurel leaves. Apollo also vowed that she like him would have eternal youth where her leaves would never turn brown or fall but would always stay lush and green. So by the mid 20th century, women throughout the Western world had completely redefined their roles in almost every social, political and cultural sphere. In the decades following the campaign for women's suffrage, a greater number of women successfully pursued careers as professional artists and designers. Yet the road was not easy, nor was it open to all. While the fight for equal rights and recognition for women would continue into the 1950s and beyond, the first major steps towards such changes began at the advent of the 20th century with women writers, photographers, artists, activists, and workers blazing a new trail for generations of women to follow. So we'll continue with some of these trailblazing women artists next month followed by women artists after World War II. You will be overwhelmed. 
So thanks again for joining us. I wish you all a very happy and healthy new year. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Um, anybody have any questions or comments about today's topic? Should we unmute? I'm not any? seeing, I'm not seeing it. Well, I'm not, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, no, but I will make a comment. Again, you have presented a really fantastic program, Dale, and I appreciate it. Um, I really didn't, I've known about the more recent, when I say recent, I mean back to the 20s, uh, women artists, but I did not really know about the ones that went all the way back that you pointed out. So I appreciate that. Thank you again. Oh, well, thank you, Linda. Yeah, I mean, and, and there are others. Um, these are just some that we feature at, at, in, Saint, in the St. Louis Museum. There are, you know, there, there are a number that made, you know, that, that did um, manage to make it through. But, I think it's interesting that women were overlooked because, you know, I don't see that art is a particularly um, masculine endeavor, I would think that I would think that art would be thought of in terms of a feminine endeavor. So uh, it's just that I guess women were just not recognized for anything. Yeah, so that's, that's why I think that's probably true. Right? Yeah. Um, I think some of these some of these when you when you go to the museum, um, these pieces are generally um, on display, these older pieces. Um, just spend some time and look at them. I mean, they're, they're, it's just incredible the talent that these women had. Um, it's it's in, without any formal training. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty incredible. Well, I was a better painter in high school than I could possibly be now, so I get it. <laughs> I can't even reckon, I can't even read my own writing anymore. I don't. <laughs> I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> uh, anybody else have any comments or questions? Well, I do hope that you will visit the museum. It it is open, um, and it's pretty big. So um, if you wear a mask, I think you can you can feel pretty safe there. Um, there is so it, these pieces are just really beautiful. So um, I hope you will will go um, to see them. Uh, they're they're it's it's pretty amazing to see what these women did. Don't you love that quote about about mm -hmm. the potato and the and the egg? I just think that's so cool. Well, I want to know. Barry has used it. I know. I come from you. you. Was it from him or from you? <laughs> well. <laughs> <It's from laughs> do I have to be honest uh -huh. <laughs> okay <laughs> no I, I found it and I told it to him and he thought you know I mean they had so many applications it can, yes, it it work, you know it's it's a I think it's a wonderful quote yeah next so, time yeah. tell him not